Your Most Avid Reader by Bibi Berkey. The Women in the Woods, Chapter 10 On the last night of August, a gentle rain fell just as the darkness came, almost like a curtain dropping and marking the close of the day. And when it had passed, the night seemed so fresh and comfortable that the workers who had sweltered in the heat all day sat outside and enjoyed the peace. Their masters, who had remained indoors away from the furnace of the sun, found that they were not tired and stayed awake with their windows open. The buzzing of the night reminded them how closely the natural world encroached on their own. The curious stilt-legged homes of the Hesiots had been brought over piecemeal from the Church of the Radiant Wanderers. Now the women were busily re-erecting them by moonlight on a half-acre of scrubland to the east of the pig enclosure. Their leader, Elizabeth, held up roof beams, despite being nearly three months pregnant, and all the while she brought out the laughter in her people with secret jokes. At least six other women in that diligent little tribe were in some stage of pregnancy. I think they actually enjoy it, the carpentry, mused Nathan gently, stopping to straighten his back for a moment. He was helping with the construction and enjoying the music of their laughter and the occasional eruption of song. Beside him was Dominic Hadley, largely useless at this kind of employment but keen to be involved. Nathan knew that Dominic had stolen out of the house without his parents' permission and had extracted a promise from the boy that if anything bad came of it, he was not to be implicated. "'Your willfulness did for your tutor,' he said, shaking his head. "'I can't afford to lose my job like he did.' But Nathan's tone was far from scolding. He couldn't remove his gaze from the Hesiot leader who would occasionally look up from her work, meet his eye, and flash back something that Dominic read as fond defiance. As he walked disconsolately back to the big house, Dominic saw the girl in the pale blue dress, the velvet ribbon at her throat, standing at the very point where the true countryside ended and the landscaped garden began. His heart leapt, I won't go back, ever, was all she told him when he arrived by her side. He soothed her. Then come with me, he said. He peered into the black of her eyes. We're returning to London for the end of the summer, my mother and sisters. Come with us. She snorted and anger flared. How? I'm a nothing. I have no money. People laugh at us. People hate us. That's not true, said Dominic. You're safe here on our land. My mother will see to it. And Nathan won't let any harm come to you. Are you blind? she persisted. My people cannot understand that a person may own land. How can money buy a piece of the earth? Who is it to sell? They will never accept this wicked idea. But in your mind, Dominic, the best people are those who say they own the earth. I don't understand what you want from us, pleaded the boy. I'm offering to protect you, you and your mother and sisters. I'll take you to Clement Street with me. We shall have the rest of the summer to ourselves. In the city we can become lost and anonymous. She eyed him suspiciously. I can trust nobody, she murmured. You can trust me he said, and took up her hand. You've always been able to trust me. Always. When Nathan got back to his cottage, his mood was light and happy. He was going to have a child. That was a good feeling. A grounding sensation for a listless man like him. And before the child was born, he would importune the mother to marry him. She had refused him so far, but he felt certain she might capitulate. It was obvious that these women wanted to integrate with local society. It's just that they had no idea how to do it. 
he and Elizabeth would show them how, by settling happily and rearing a family. How dare you, came a voice from the gloom of his cottage. He stopped in the open doorway. How dare you tear my heart in two? You've never spoken of hearts before, he told Anne Hadley. She stepped forward so that he could see her outline against the meagre moonlight. We had no need to discuss hearts, she shrugged. I assumed yours was as closed as mine. The mistress of Hindwald moved closer to him and lowered the hood which had been obscuring much of her face. But now, she continued, now I've discovered that you fathered a bastard with a gypsy. I found that my heart was perhaps not quite as close to you as I thought. You see, Nathan, it rather hurts to have heard the gossip about you from my own maid. She reached out and laid a hand on his chest observing him a little too coldly for a lover. I have every intention that you remain as useful to me as you've been these past years, and you will start to show that usefulness by dropping that peasant girl. She's not mine to drop, he replied, and knew as he said it that it was truer than he had ever admitted to himself. With his soul sagging, he implored her, Leave them be. A smile darted to her lips. Oh, you think they're the good people, do you? The righteous ones? Even Harrington didn't believe that. Oh, Nathan. Innocence is just another word for stupidity. The good folk of this world simply disappear and deserve to. It is the successful ones, like my family, who make their mark. You are wise to hang about our necks and benefit from our success. From your wealth, he muttered. Wealth comes of success. These good women, as you see them, are fools and deserve what they will get. Their honesty and distasteful candour will get them nowhere. They deserve to fail, to disappear. Is obscurity such a bad outcome, he wanted to know. My children will be worth something. Yours, via these nomads, will be worthless. I don't seek fame nor money, he said. I dare say you think me a fool, but I know good folk when I see them. But she merely smiled fondly at his idiocy. Why expect him to understand? And leaned beyond him to close the door and stop the world outside from knowing their vulgar truth. Once, as I lay in his arms, the sun pouring through my open window and across our faces, I had the feeling that there was nothing else but this. I had to laugh, and I may have laughed heartily and honestly for the first time since childhood. I lay across him, and I was convulsed. It was a kind of deviant happiness, a shocking purity of sensation. We were alone in the sunshine. Doesn't that sound good? He was puzzled, and I remember him attempting to look into my face and to understand, which made me laugh all the more. I wanted to infect him with my laughter, to join me. But all he said was this. I don't really like you. I stopped. Not out of shock. No, just because I was suddenly embarrassed that he might have misinterpreted my laughter. He was holding me, after all. His arms were wrapped around me. He was possessing me. You don't have to like me, I said. Liking and love don't need to coexist. I suspect love is all the better for a sprinkling of dislike. I love my wife, he said. Don't think I was upset. I knew he had loved his wife, but I was convinced that he loved me now. He was in turmoil. This was the first stage of falling out of love with his wife. You hold it against the bringer of the turmoil. You don't do this with her, I said. This, what we've just done, what we've been doing for weeks, or not in the same way anyway. We won't do it forever, came the simple logic, and that's when I cracked. 
not visibly, not in front of him, but that's when the terror struck. I knew then that for him this could all be a passing entertainment, a momentary madness. But for me, what was it for me? I genuinely loved the man. I wanted him. He possessed me. Why? Why did I want him? Men had always wanted me. Why did this one hurl me towards oblivion, towards total collapse, without so much as a whimper from me? I can't really explain it. It all caught me off guard. He was more candid, more controlling, more arrogant than even I was. That hideous mix might have put other people off, but not me. It was positively alluring to me. He was the one, I was sure of it, the one that fitted with me. And so it was impossible that he fitted with his wife. His coming to me was a cry for release. I would release him from the stagnation of his life with that woman. He had children too. How evil of her to force him into such unwanted responsibility. With me, he would have only pleasure and release. I would ask nothing but for all of him. I said to him, Stay with me, leave her, I'll give you everything. I will give up everything for you. We can be like this forever. Just writing that last sentence makes me shudder. I listened to myself saying it there, to him, in my bed, in the promise of that sunshine, and I wonder at myself. I'm not ashamed. I'm not embarrassed. I just wonder at myself. Would you give up your writing? he asked. Like a shot, I said. And then I asked, do you want me to? Is that what you want me to do? And at last he laughed. Why would you give up your writing for me? He moved away from me, sat up on the edge of the bed. I loved the bend of his back, his shoulders as smooth as planed wood. I loved to touch his pale, freckled skin. I loved how tightly it fitted all around him, how hard it was against the drooping softness of my breasts and my stomach. Those differences felt right. Because you just asked me to. Because I love you. In films, that first utterance of a declaration of love cranks the action onto a different plane. It certainly did for us. I realised at once that it wasn't what he wanted to hear. He reached down to the floor to pick up his T-shirt. I don't want you to give up anything for me. All you must give up is me. Some day, very soon. I cried. And he didn't. As he dressed, this is what I said to myself. When you leave, I shall do all I can to find out your address. It won't be hard. And when I do, I shall get dressed, and I shall catch a train, and I shall go to your house, and whether you're there or not, I'll tell your wife that your marriage is over, and I will free you, and... and... the rest doesn't matter. He had some tea in silence, and then he left. As he stood in the doorway, I caught him round the waist, and pulled myself up to him, and kissed him, and he kissed me back after a fashion, and said, Don't know when I'll see you next time. I'll work something out. I said to myself, You'll see me very soon, very, very soon, my love, and then I shall release you. I would release him into captivity. With me. <laughs> Monica by Georgina Sutton. The male narrator was Mark Lingwood. Your Most Avid Reader was written by Bibi Berkey with sound editing by Mark Lingwood. It was made by Tempest Productions and brought to you with the kind support of Rattlesnake Books, an established seller of books, maps, ephemera, art and curiosities. Rattlesnake Books can be found on Instagram, Etsy, Abe Books and Biblio.